Hey, thanks for still being there. This is Rise and Shine. Of course, uh, we just came back from the table of the news brief and uh, we have all the very trending uh, conversations we'll be having at this minute. Yesterday, uh, it was um, rumored or more like a breaking news about some of the major stories making the rounds in Aquibum State. We I would just give us an introduction to that particular one. Okay, just yesterday we had information that um, the Chief Judge of Aquibum State, Her Honor Ekaita Obot, has sent Inibere Fiong, who is a human rights lawyer, to prison reportedly over a plea for safety during court proceedings. Um, of course, um, the lawyer, Efion, was the one who first of all released, you know, um, a statement in that regard. Um, he alleged in his tw of official Twitter handle on Wednesday that the judge sent him to prison when he came to court to defend Leo Ekbeyong, who is in a, um, a libel suit against... Um, a libel and defamation suit against the governor of a Kwaibom state. Um, of course, um, a lawyer in libel suit filed by Udom Emmanuel, the governor of a Kwaibom state. Narrating the incident, he said the judge had earlier sent some reporters out of the court and he, um, in Ibege Efion, pleaded that since it was a, a public hearing, these people should be allowed to be in the court and um, thereafter it said that he also pleaded and expressed his um, feeling on feeling of unsafety with the presence of um, armed policemen in the courtroom uh, and of course at that point it is said that the chief judge who was presiding over the case um, asked that he be thrown out of bar and that he will be sent to um, the, the the prison, of course, correctional facility. So this case has actually brought a lot of uproar in the city, that, beyond the city of Aquibum, actually. Um, the case is it, it nationally, um, it has caused an uproar nationally. People are responding and giving their two cents about the situation. But we know that the law has a stand. We know that the law has a proceeding. And we know that the law is guided by decorum and civility. So, of course, we're going to be having these conversations with um, um, a lawyer who will be joining us on screen um, virtually to Ex to explain some of the um, integrities about the situation and we also have here with us Annie Justin who is um, a public affairs analyst he will be speaking on behalf of the people you know just sharing his opinions about the whole situation so I think we'll start from Annie what's your basic understanding about what is happening good morning good everybody. morning yeah. uh, about uh, the Nibere issue I think that um, first and foremost, uh, it is said that lawyers or uh, even judges should be very circumspect about uh, contempt cases because contempt as a, a, as a concept is not really defined like it's based on the situation. So a case of contempt in one court could be, could, may not be the case of contempt in another depending on, on the issues and the proceedings. So it is said that judges should be circumspect about contempt cases. Now, away from that, I think um, Inibere Fion is, as, as a human rights activist, is someone that is trying to cut his path specifically in um, the Nigerian scene. And he's becoming a, a rave these days, even outside of Kwaibum states. So when um, he comes in to try to defend, like he's trying to defend Leo, a fellow lawyer who has that defamation case, I think um, the judge should understand that Inibere is a very smart young man. Uh, I'm seeing Inibere using emotional intelligence to draw interest of the wider legal luminary to that case. I don't look at um, the content itself. I look at it as a, that Inibere is trying to make people aware of the main case by drawing their own um, focus through his own contempt thing. Um, the contempt thing is premeditated because already he was able to make the judge unhappy before then. I think in, a, in one of those proceedings. Premeditated on yes, whose part now in the yes. part? Yes, on his part. Yes, I think so. Because um, I know the judge has said he, he had, she had threatened 
that is going to she's going to lock him up before that time before that time so um Inibe having a very high emotional intelligence is an intellectual guy was trying to still draw that out actually he's right by asking that um the foot uh, the foot extent being the journalist should be allowed in court i mean it was a public hearing and uh, he might also be right by asking that he's feeling unsafe by seeing him um, gun welding policemen in the courts okay so and yes. before we continue um we have the barrister Imo Iapan, who is a legal practitioner and public affairs uh, analyst, join us. He's also principal partner at Kadi Nali Chamber uh, Law Firm. He's joining us from Abuja. Good morning, Barrister. And many thanks for joining us. Hello. Yeah, good morning. Oh, many thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. I, okay. I hope um, we don't have a disruption in the network. No, I, I pray so as well. My pleasure. Okay. So let's start. Um, we also have um, a political affairs analyst in the studio here with us, Annie Justin. He's also going to be sharing his thoughts on this matter as he has started already. And of course, um, I also have another presenter here, Uyai Anyekan. She's also uh, part of the conversation this morning. Good morning, Barrister. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so um, of course, clearly, the, the situation is out there uh, about um, Justice Ikaito Boat's judgment against um, Inibere Fiong as to sending him to prison for one month. I know that um, the Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, Serap, has also come upon this matter. I also know that um, a senior advocate of Nigeria and the person of uh, Falano is also on this matter he has taken it up but as a legal perspective or rather from a legal perspective now what do you think is wrong or right with this particular judgment uh, well thank you you, you it, well that is a judgment of a court that is a decision of the court and um, first of all as a lawyer it wouldn't be right for me to pick holes in terms of um, saying the decision of the court is right or saying the decision of the court is wrong um, without looking at the background facts, without looking at the basis, without looking at the indicators, without looking at the indices upon which um, that decision was arrived at. Now, the general impression, even for non-lawyers, is that um, the decision most probably was too harsh it was too spontaneous and it was an, a wrong exercise of judicial power. Now, let's first understand that the court, in fact, every court created by the Constitution has the right and owes itself that duty to protect its majesty and its integrity. Every court has that right. Now, for every court, uh, it would also depend on who the judex, who the presiding officer of the court is. But there are basic parameters, there are basic thresholds which um, our laws have stipulated um, that is expected of presiding officers of court. First of all, you must be very temperate, you must um, be well comported, you must not be easily angered, you must not be easily irritated, you must always 100% take charge of the proceedings of your court all the time take charge of the proceedings of your court. Um, you must direct who you want your court to be. Um, corresponding, correspondingly, lawyers are also required as ministers in the temple of justice to observe absolute court decorum, to be courteous to the court, courteous to their to his or her colleagues at the bar, and um, maintain the highest um, level of uh, dignity. Now, looking at this case specifically, um, what we have read in the media space shows that there has been a background to it. And maybe for purpose of clarity, it might be necessary to just mention a few things. First Go of ahead, all, sir. this was a judgment. This was a judgment, and um, that was delivered. Well, what is called a default judgment. A default judgment is a judgment that is delivered um, without the defence 
um, making an input without the defense putting up a defense. And uh, in this case, the defendant has a right uh, subsequently if he shows proper cause and reason to say, well, I was not there when this judgment was delivered. It was delivered by default. Now I am ready. Uh, I have a defense in law. Please, can you set aside that judgment and let the trial go on with my full defense? So that judgment was delivered. The case of defamation filed by uh, the governor of Kwaibom State against a lawyer by Salih Ekoyon. That judgment was for the sum of 1.5 billion. You know, I think sometime last year. Um, fast forward to towards end of the year, um, that judgment was set aside by the same court of his, his lordship, Justice Obut, and um, trial then commenced proper. And that is where my learned friend and colleague uh, in Libre Refium Esquire came into the picture. And it was the contention of counsel that um, he feels, or his client feels, that if judgment was given in the first instance against him, even when he had no defense or he didn't put up a defense, now that there is an order for retrial, um, um, the case should be remitted or reassigned to another judge because, according to him, his client felt that, well, um, he didn't have much confidence in this particular court handling that. Now, you hear all of these complaints all of the time. And a litigant is at will uh, and very free to express doubts and misgivings because the law and justice is rooted elementarily in confidence. If people come to court and they feel that, well, given the setup of this arrangement, uh, one is not likely going to get justice. A litigant is free uh, to open up and say, well, I, I don't think that because of the way things are going, I am going to get justice. But I want to defend myself all the same. Can you transfer this case to any other judge? And I'm sure, I, I believe that that application was made sometime on the 23rd of June from the reports we have heard, um, that that motion for transfer or reassignment, what you call recusal. Recusal is that the court being complained against washes its hands of the matter. And then in the case of the chief judge, you transfer the case file. If it was any other court, you send the case file to the chief judge who reassigns that to any other judge. Now, that application has not been taken. It has not been argued. And so therefore it is still pending. But here are the parties before the court. What we have heard most about this case are the reportage from the media. After every court sitting, you have more or less a blow by blow reportage of the details of what transpired in court. Now, as a general rule, the media is not usually allowed to come into the court, for instance, to do recording of court proceedings, except with the leave of court, except with the permission, express permission of the court. But because the court is also a public place, guaranteed by the Constitution, anybody, anybody has a right to walk into the courtroom and sit down, maintain the decorum of court, and um, observe proceedings. If you have a piece of paper and you want to take note, no problem. But you cannot come there with a recording device without the permission of the court and then begin to record, especially in such a manner that would distract or even catch the attention of the presiding officer. So it's an open proceeding and anybody has a right to come in there. And from what we saw and what we have heard, um, I have not heard, since I was not there, I have not heard what the version of the court is. But what I have seen in the media is that on this particular day, His Lordship walks into the courtroom um, and of course warns counsel that um, the court will not take for granted issues surrounding its dignity and majesty. And so therefore, the court will not also hesitate to discipline any erring lawyer who takes the dignity of the court for granted. And at that point, according to the report, uh, his lordship ordered that security men, uh, armed security men, be introduced into the courtroom, uh, probably to check and maintain some kind of order and um, sanity. And I'm also told that counsel also raised the fact that, well, 
Um, he doesn't feel safe. He doesn't feel comfortable. His safety is not guaranteed. If you have um, officers of the law wielding AK-47 assault rifles right within the four corners of the courtroom, every judicial officer is entitled to an arms-bearing police officer. You know, and usually we see them with pistols, you know, concealed under their belts or wherever. But you, you hardly find, if I haven't seen, uh, security personnel with AK-47 assault rifles, you know, brandishing, brandishing them in court. Uh, that is not a robbery scene. In fact, in my years of practice, I've also had cause to also raise objection and draw the court's attention to the fact that there was a police officer who accompanied a uh, government official into court proceedings. And um, as far as I was concerned, the way he held the arm um, in a very menacing fashion, and I, it appeared to me that the nozzle was pointed in my direction. I, I, had, to, I, had, I had to cry out to the court and said I wasn't comfortable because I wasn't even sure anymore if this was a courtroom or a police station. And um, his lordship um, agreed with me, and the, the, the government official apologized that he didn't know that uh, his orderly had come into the courtroom with him with an AK-47 rifle, and he had an option. Is either you step out with your rifle or you drop your rifle outside if you must um, uh, continue to remain with your boss and then walk in without that arm. And that was exactly what happened. He had to walk out of the courtroom and proceedings commenced or, or continued uh, as it were. So for the event in the Kwaibom State High Court before the Honorable Chief Judge, um, even when counsel was asked to proceed in case, he, he pointed out to his lordship that my lord, um, we have a pending application um, asking my lord to recuse himself from going on with this case and asking for a transfer of the case file. And I'm told that his lordship also insisted that, well, procedures and proceedings in this court are determined by the court. So go ahead um, with the proceedings for the day. And that continued. And I'm also told that somewhere midway through this um, a proceeding, uh, his lordship also cited somebody who was identified as a journalist. Um, I'm not sure now whether he had a recording device, but I'm told that his phone was seized from him. I don't know how he handled the phone. Uh, there are courts you go to and the judge tells you, look, I don't want to see you display your, your handsets, even on the table. If you have a handset, put it in your pocket and put it in your bag or you turn down the volume or whatsoever. So I, I don't know how that handset was held or that, how that device was held. But I'm told that um, he was ordered to walk out of the court and then the device was confiscated. And also at that point, uh, Leonard Council also said, well, um, since this is a public hearing, this is also an open court uh, that people, including journalists, have the right uh, to come in and view proceedings and observe proceedings. That is actually the correct uh, procedure of law. It is only in very um, extreme and exceptional situations cases that border on national security, cases that have to do with minors, um, where only the party strictly, lawyer, and then maybe one or two other persons are allowed to remain in the court and every other person um, is kept outside. In fact, proceedings like that in most times are also held in the chambers of the court, not in the open, because of the sensitive nature and demands of such a proceeding. But this is an open court. And then counsel felt that, well, my lord, having given an order that um, a journalist be walked out of the court, that it wasn't proper. Now, in fairness to the court, I do not know, because I cannot report verbatim the exact words used in the proceedings before my lord. I also do not know um, the pitch and tone and loudness of voice that was deployed in making all of the applications and submissions of my lord, or before my lord. Because even when you are saying the most harmless, speaking the most harmless words, even method and manner gesticulation, gesticulation and swinging of the arms may also suggest disrespect. So, the choice of words, the pitch of tone, and then your body language would also be sending meaning because in communication, it is not just about the voice. 
the body language, the movement of the hands and the legs and so on, also determines. And these are the things um, those who were in court or my Lord who presided would be able to say amounted to disrespect or to indecorous conduct within the court. Now I know my learned friend um, in Ibn Esquire. I know that he's an activist. I know that he's a radical. I know that he's also a thoroughbred lawyer. And I know that as an activist, his speech and the sound of his voice is usually normally on the high side. I mean, you hardly hear him. Even when we watch him on television and we hear him on radio, the pitch of his voice is usually on the high side. Now, if that is his mode and manner and method of communication, it only requires understanding to know that, well, this is the way he talks. It's not necessarily that he's angry or he's being offensive or he's being disrespectful, but that is just the way he talks. We find a lot of other public speakers who are very agitated in the way and manner of their expression, but you have others who are also calm so that no matter the degree and level of frustration and annoyance or irritation, they maintain their cool and continue to convey the messages they want to convey. So I know my learned friend, um, it is also possible that he may have spoken at a pitch which is misunderstood. I mean, I always use myself as an example. I had also uh, said something in court some years ago, and my colleagues at the bar felt I ought to apologize for the words, the choice of words I had used, and the, the fact that it sounded disrespectful. And I explained to my Lord, I said, well, maybe given my years and age at the bar at the time, um, they must take the substance of my submission and leave the mood, the mood and method of my communication. The judge at the time understood and said, well, if you were a, a, a much senior lawyer, we would understand that probably you are being mischievous. But since you are a younger person, let us take it that you don't also appreciate fully okay. what is required of you, that in your comportment, in your communication, you ought to uh, maintain some some level of le level of equanimity and then um, tranquility in the court. Okay. So these are the things that play out when looking at the scenarios, what exactly happened, and then how the court and why the court arrived at the decision. I also want to commend you, you know, for giving us like a background to this particular story, and also, you know, trying to like um, analyze from both ends uh, the situation and how, you know, uh, the complexities of some of these actions are being taken. But again, will you agree with some people that, you know, um, one month imprisonment given as just uh, judgments to Inibega for whatever, you know, action he took in court was actually, is actually fair enough? Or it's more like, like uh, I'm going to put it like, you know, uh, people are saying impunity and rascality on the part of the judge. Well, it, it, it's, it is not going to be impunity. Well, rather, I, I, I refuse to use the word impunity, and I also refuse to use the word rascality. Um, first of all, the court has the powers to punish for contempt in fascia curia, Latin expression meaning in the face of the court, right in the presence of the judge in the courtroom as opposed to ex facie courier, which is outside of the courtroom. If it is an infraction outside of the courtroom, then a, another judge has to try that matter. Um, the relevant forms, forms 48 and 49, would have to be served on the offending party, on the content no, the party co uh, committing the content, and then a full trial you know, is conducted where the party has an opportunity to defend himself. Now, in this particular case, the alleged act of contempt occurred right before my Lord, right in the courtroom, which is contempt, for whatever it is worth, in fascia courier. It therefore means that you do not need external evidence. You don't need external corroboration for you to say whether this amounted to contempt or not. What it only requires is that in the mind of the court, what the court adjudges to be contempt is what contempt is. So therefore, 
you have what is called a summary trial. Now, this is also very delicate and dicey because it would mean that it is the impression the court gets about the conduct of a particular person within the court that will be used to arrive at a decision. And this is where the courts have been admonished in, uh, in severally, especially by the Supreme Court. The power to commit for content must be used sparingly. In fact, the Supreme Court says it is right, it is correct for a lawyer to criticize the court openly. It is right for a lawyer to show displeasure at what the court is doing openly. But it must not be disrespectful. I mean, it means that we can disagree without being disagreeable. Again, this is also a, manner, a matter of semantics. How do you express it? If you want to disagree with the court, what we have been taught and what the rules of practice says, you always, you know, you are humble enough and respectful enough to say, oh, well, uh, my Lord, the greatest respect, we may not agree with this and that and that. What you are actually telling the court is that, my Lord, with the greatest respect, I disagree with you. But you see, you must choose your words very carefully. So in this case, yes, the court is right. But you see, in exercising the rightness of the court, the court also must be temperate enough to accommodate and tolerate. In fact, the greater emphasis is on the court to demonstrate elasticity of accommodation. Otherwise, for every lawyer who comes to court and says the things that are not palatable to, ear, to the ears, will end up in prison custody for one month or more at the discretion of the court or as the court pleases. Okay, so, uh, no matter what counsel does, no matter what counsel does, as, and you see, this is what is critical. You have a counsel who is representing a client, and that counsel, for whatever reason, has been committed to prison. What happens to the client? How is the right of the client protected? How does the client feel? Because the first thing that happens to the client, because that's how you see the public, why you see the public outcry, the first thing is despondency. If counsel can be committed for con content, then the rest of us who are non-initiates, who are not members of you know, um, this ministerial temple of justice, what becomes of us? And so therefore, that comradery, comradery must be there. There must be corresponding respect, counsel to court, and then um, accommodation of court and right, counsel at the bar. Okay. I also understand that even before the, the order was made, counsel had... Um, um, solicited and pleaded on behalf of the uh, name uh, for the court to tamper justice with mercy. mercy. But I think, which is what has become obvious, that there has been a build up, you know, of irritation over time. In fact, I have read something in the media uh, sometime where uh, statements like, um, be careful how you talk in this court, this is not Channel Channel's television or AKBC. You know, I have not seen the record of the court, but you know, that is also reported that um, it must have come from the court. So you see that um, you must have had a build-up. You must have had a build-up. And it just got to breaking point yesterday that um, the court had to arrive at this decision. Oh, okay. I think as a person, okay. I think as a person that I would go with the admonition of the Supreme Court that no matter how critical counsel is of court, so long as it is not outright disrespect and denigration of the position of the court, uh, and desecration of the integrity and the majesty of the court, the court ought to continue to exercise elasticity and accommodate the interests of the council. All right. Uh, um, the court needs to be able to be as elastic as possible. Thank you for that response. But looking at the sensitivity of the situation at hand, we know that this is um, a case that was filed by the governor of the state, um, Sir Udom Emmanuel, um, on account of defamation by Leo Ekbeon. Um, seeing the parties involved in the case, one would say is a very sensitive um, case that has been handled by the court. And we know that um, Barista Inibere Feyong had actually moved 
and has pointed out to the judge that he sent some form of bias coming from the judge who was presiding over the case and had also moved that um, the case should be moved to another um, judge to preside over. Now, looking at the fact that this case is a senti sensitive one that involves the governor of a Ibem state and is being presided over by the chief judge of the state, who is also, um, of course, has some measure of field. Well, one would say it at the same table with the governor of the state. Will you say that um, there is actually ground of bias and of course the opinion of so many people also carries that um we see the governor attempting to execute executive powers into how the process has flown so far well um i have i've mentioned in my background that um the, the couple of things must have happened and the litigant is entitled if if for any reason you feel that you're not going to get justice the law demands and gives you that right to express it very clearly. And um, the concept of recusal is since justice is rooted in confidence, since justice is rooted in confidence, what would the ordinary man go away with? What impression would he have looking at all the facts of this case? Where a litigant says, I do not have confidence in your ability to dispense justice given circumstances A, B, and C. What is required is for the judge, the presiding officer, to wash off his hands from the case and have, because there is nothing, there ought to be nothing a judge or presiding officer has that is personal in a particular case. If there is a conflict of interest, suo motu, on your own volition and authority, you hands on the case. You don't wait to be prompted to hands on the case. Now, where now you are prompted, where litigant now says, look, I do not have confidence. And he doesn't just say it. He goes on ahead to document it. And that application is pending. L let's not go to the, the, the fact that the executive governor of a quiet home state, you know, I mean, has now developed this penchant for taking people to court, you know, uh, every now and then, you are arraigned magistrate court for criminal defamation. You are sued for libel. You know, public officers who detest, who are irritated at criticism, who are irritated at public scrutiny, who do not want to be asked questions that bothers on accountability for stewardship, have no business being in public office. But you see, when you are irritated at the slightest thing, the citizen does. It gives rise to things like this. So when the governor becomes interested in every case bordering on defamation of character and um, libel and so on and so forth, well, this is what has given rise to this. So I, if I were the presiding officer and somebody says, well, uh, for whatever reason, I, I think probably you have some, you share some affinity, you share some relationship, or uh, given your position, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm just not confident. I, I don't know why I feel this way, but I have a strong inner feeling uh, suggested by certain facts that I'm not going to get justice. The best thing to do, the right thing to do, the law is that you hands off the case file. You can't insist on adjudicating a matter that parties are no longer comfortable with. And the person we're talking about is actually the defendant. It's a citizen who feels that the actions of the governor are in the first place oppressive where the governor deploys the instrument of states against an individual i mean the entire apparatus of states against an individual it is wrong and it is very petty anyways so I, I think that circumstances some of the reasons why you know the juicing body over the judiciary has always uh you know asked for complete autonomy of the judiciary so that things like this do not happen again so it's more like who who he will pays the piper is detecting the tune okay so let's look at this other issue i think um uh, we have um, right. a political Maybe analyst in the in in the studio this morning and uh, Ani, you were saying something about um in Ibege, you know um being deliberate about his actions yesterday in court to draw some kind of attention 
of course, it has actually drawn that kind of attention right now. So let's just um, give you some time to express yourself more on that. And so um, Barrister can take up from there and respond to, you know, perception. your perception of the issue. Uh, I was I was saying that um, I feel Inibe is using um, his position to agitate or to make the court to place those uh, sanctions on him, the sentence, and by doing that, attract a wider interest, a wider legal interest to the main issue. I mean, um, when we read about the interest of um, people, uh, legal luminaries like um, Femi Falana, San, and um, the Serap, as we are, we are speaking, they wouldn't have known about this case, the case between um, the governor and um, yeah, Barrister yeah. Leo Ekpenyo. So I think um, Inibe also inadvertently or maybe intentionally is using his emotional intelligence to drag the interest of the wider legal luminary to this case. So um, I might see that um, he's being intentional about it. Uh, we must give it to him. Inibeg is um, a very brilliant young man. But aside from saying brilliant here, yeah. would you also say that he's very controversial? He's, he's controversial, yes. As a human rights um, activist, activist, he's very controversial. And I, need, I think he needs most of those controversy to be able to stem through most of um, the things that come his way. So, I'm thinking um, away from um, the proceedings of that court, he was able to inflame the judge by his action so that he could generate a positive interest from the wider masses to what was happening about that case. And um, we must not forget that Inibe as a person is a, a person that is social media savvy. You know, when this issue happened, he took to social media. And um, his composition and body language was that of someone that had some fulfillment from being sent to that correctional uh, center. I heard when he said, um, maybe this is an opportunity for me to see the other side and also get to see what people pass through being in, correct in the correctional center. And he was smiling and laughing. And I was asking myself, what's that um, sense of um, accomplishment is having? I was expecting to see him agitated or furious about being sent to a correctional center. So I, I tried to put one and one together and said, this young man knows what he's doing. This young man is trying to get an aim. So um, I would want Barrister also to look at yes, it from that definitely. angle. And Barrister Afan, please, let's have your feel on this uh, particular opinion from uh, Annie Justin. Well, um, I agree with him, uh, but I said, Nibere, my colleague, is a very brilliant lawyer and he's very outspoken. Um, he's a civil rights activist and so therefore has a wide network of civil rights organizations that he works with. Um, I know for a fact that he does a lot of pro bono cases. Uh, he defended and got the UNO, you know, I think, uh, I've forgotten the number now, but I think there were about 20 or 30 students who were clamped in, in detention, he got them out. Um, he's done quite a number of cases for Aquaibon people who have um, been thrown into jail. I, I remember he did that of Kufre Kata. He did that, a few other journalists around. And um, so he has become a voice, um, a notable, that loud voice that um, has taken the course of the oppressed. And it is little wonder that you see the public outcry you know, the public indignation at um, what has um, happened to him. Now, no lawyer goes to court and expects that from the courtroom he should end up in prison. And even if he was based in Lagos, you know, so I, I appeared in the same court with him at the Federal High Court two days ago, and then he picked the last flight and arrived in New York to do his matter. And um, he didn't appear to me that, well, you know, I want to spend my next one month of... Um, as vacation commences in prison. Nobody wants to do that. But you see, as a lawyer who has been the, the, through the thick and thin of life, you take issues with equanimity. You don't expect him to be in court and be shedding tears. You know, that's, that's a man. And um, yes, every stage of life and whatever it is life throws at you, it's also an opportunity to learn. 
and then you maximize. So I have also been in prison before. I've had cause to be in prison. I spent three days. Maybe it wasn't up to one month, but I've also spent three days. You know, so um, you go in there and you see a different world view, and then you come out definitely stronger. Our correctional system in Nigeria is counterproductive. So anybody who sends you to jail and feels that you come out broken, what is uh, is He's not telling the truth. You come out firmer. I know he's going to come out a stronger person. He, he's also aware of um, the groundswell of opinion. Serap is on it. The Twitter is burning. A quiet boom state is trending. And I dare say for the negative reasons. You know, um, he, uh, um, and he has mentioned the Femi Falana, Falana SAM. They are all proceeding to court to challenge the legality of the decision of the chief judge of quiet boom state. And like I said, you see, because of the institution involved, we must be careful. We must be circumspect so that we don't do and say things. The, 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 the comments we have read so far on social media shows that over 95% of the people are not happy and don't see any reason, any rationale for um, that decision against me, um, Belafion. That is a lawyer, for God's sake. And you see, the law profession is like a small segment of society and then um, we should look after one another so i, I don't think that um in Ibega okay so we brought we, this on himself deliberately okay this so, so we see like done consistently about about his practice just one more point this is what he has done deliberately about his style of practice and that's the fact that the media he happens to court the friendship of the media so he's on every other television station every other day and you know he's on twitter um, every other day, tweeting about the things he does on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, not every lawyer does that, reporting on every move he makes in court and so on. But you see, the things he has also said, judging from his social media uh, posts, shows that over time there has been a build-up. And that gives us a perspective, a background to understanding exactly what this case is about. So while I will not... Um, um, cast suspicions on the person of the chief judge of a state uh, by drawing unnecessary parallels and um, relationships with the governor. But I think that given the sensitive nature, nature of the those involved, one must be more circumspect. And this would have been avoided. It, it, it was, a, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's, just, it's a minor thing, but one or two persons got over, over overboard. One or two persons got overboard. When, when my Lord comes into court and first of all tells you, look, today I need the company of two armed policemen. Um, I'm, I'm, not ready to, I'm not ready to tolerate nonsense. You just know that there has been a build-up. Okay, and, sir. Um, it just took, yes, it just took a little act of uh, probably indiscretion or something to, to boil over. Okay, so the situation that um, Barista Inibege Efeng is currently going through is familiar, uh, familiar, quite similar to something that um, Ghani Fayemi experienced in, in, in 1990. Oh, sure. Now, we are looking at the fact that we want to ask, how do you think this um, injunction by the chief judge is going to affect the case that Inibege Efeng was handling? You know, um, we might... Um, in, in the case of um, Ghani Fayemi, the case was upturned. What are the expectations of the court and, of, of course, fellow lawyers like yourself and other luminaries with regards to the current case that Inibiga was handling in court? Do you see the tendency of this co um, um, case being swayed in a direction that um, Inibiga might not have wanted it to go if he was still in effectively in charge of the court proceedings as a defendant, of course? I can't tell you what the eventual outcome of this matter will be, but I can tell you, I can tell you some of the processes that are, that have been triggered by this case. First of all, this action and decision is going to be challenged very vigorously, and I'm sure as I speak, once the record of proceedings for um, that day is ready, it's going to be challenged. Therefore, means that the jurisdiction uh, and the action or decision of the court. Um, would be out there for public scrutiny at the Court of Appeal. And um, knowing who a neighbor is, I dare tell you that even if he doesn't get a favorable outing at the Court of Appeal, to proceed to the Supreme Court. Now, there are several interests involved. Like I said, I don't know how it would end up, but I know that 
I mean, without being a soothsayer, I know that this case cannot continue. Given, you know, this explosive state before that court, I don't see by saying need the FBI returning after one month and then going to continue in that court as if nothing happened. I don't also expect that the court would pretend as if on the 27th of July um, nothing happened. Uh, we just flow um, as if it's business as usual. So there's going to be definitely going to be an interruption. There's going to be there are going to be petitions flying here and there. I, I can assure you of that because of the things I have heard and seen already. Um, there's going to be a, a huge backlash. There's going to be a huge backlash, and it is unfortunate because. Um, the judiciary is on trial, the law profession is on trial. We have seen things happening with the legal professional disciplinary committee. We've seen things happening um, linked to the chairman of the body of ventures and his partner. We have seen a lot which um, doesn't paint a good picture of the law profession. And um, now, Aquarium of State has now come um, under the radar uh, with what has happened before my lord, the chief judge's court. So. I, I believe that that case will not go on in that court, and um, the case will eventually have to be transferred. And see, it is the same transfer we're talking about. If we had transferred this case, um, all of these things wouldn't have happened. You see, I keep saying that justice is rooted in confidence. If you have applications pending before the court, yes, the court has a right to take whichever application and to dictate the, which process it takes first what you call case management. You see, even if this case continues before that court and judgment is given against the defendant, going by the fact that there has been complaints prior to judgment, bordering on fair hearing, bordering on alleged bias, bordering on lack of confidence, it will be upturned. Because nobody will be able to understand why there is a complaint against your person and your ability or capacity to dispense justice, and you decide to sit tight. If there is nothing in the case, well, let's just hand off the case file, and then okay. it goes mm. to any other court. Okay. Yeah, uh, so that uh, um, the parties can ventilate their case and then move on. Okay. We want to also assume that, uh, you know, the things you have stated right now are some of the implications of this particular judgment by Justice uh, Ekaito Boot. So I didn't get that. I said, I want to take that, um, the things you have said so far, the backlash and, um, of course, the, the case not continuing in that particular court, are some of the implications of this particular judgment from uh, the Chief George Ikaito Boot. Oh, definitely it is going to come to that, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. There is no way that case will continue in that court, no matter how we want to feel about it. There is no way, because, you see, um, it, it would just mean that this is, this is step one of violence in court. And so therefore we will make for the next phase of violence if we insist that the case must continue in that court. There is something about the case. Anyways, uh, for, case. For, for, want time, for want of time, for want of time, Barry Sarkman, for want of time, we want to thank you very much for coming on our show virtually to give us an explicit explanation as to this particular judgment and its implication. Thank you very much. Uh, Barista Imo E. Akpan, legal practitioner and public affairs analyst, and also principal partner at Kadinali Chambers uh, Law Firm. Thank you so much for your time this morning with us. Thank you very much. Have a good one today. And you too. Okay, so back here, it's it's been quite a revealing explanation. You know, sometimes uh, the complexities around cut judgments and all of that is something that knocks you up sometimes, it's, yeah. except you're in that field before you can actually understand how those things work. But I'm happy that he was able to give us both sides of the story and both sides of, um, you know, what transpired in court. And true to fact that, you know, the media just jumped up on this particular uh, news, not also wanting to like find out exactly what you know uh, was the true situation of things. So we only the media only hopped on what a barista in Ibega at the time was you know uh, beaming live from his Facebook page. So yeah.
<laughs> well, I, I think it's um, it's clear enough because um, Barry Stackman has given us the implication from both ends mm -hmm. when it comes to what should be expected. You know, what what will come out as a result of this judgment as given by um, the chief judge, um, mm -hmm. Kaito Obot, and then what is going to and what might come off as an implication from um, Inibega's end. We see that the trajectory over this case is actually going to take a different turn, mm -hmm. and we do hope that it takes a turn that is in favor of justice, whatever the justice. Um, uh, yes, whatever the justice system was going to vet as justice for this case. But I mean, if a case has become as controversial as this, it, it becomes um, imperative for the court to begin to look for other ways to execute judgment, you know, fairly, you know. Um, so anyone who goes to court must be favored because um it, it, it is the last hope of the common man I that's what the court is for it's the last hope of the common man so at this point we just hope that of course we trust the nba um, and other governing bodies of the judiciary to be able to step in and of course give the right direction as as the case may be like um barrister said a bomb is in, in limelight for some of the uh, wrong reasons and um but we hope that we can nav navigate out of these murky waters and we also want to thank you um very much justin for coming and sharing your very enlightened view about the situation thank you all right then so at this point we'll take a very quick break and then when we return we will be bringing you the very last part of our show this morning do stay with us Thank you.